Okay, so I hope you're all doing good out there, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining today. It's absolutely lovely to see so many of you in the chat and having a little bit of a catch up. It's really, really, really lovely. So thanks ever so much. And there are, like I said earlier, there are many different translations of this written in German originally. And I think I have found quite a good one. I was going to actually read the foreword of this particular version, uh, which just spoke a little bit about how they've translated it, that it's supposed to be one of the most authentic versions, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So I'll just jump into the story. I really hope you enjoy it. Remember that this story is technically hundreds of years old, and even this particular writing is, um, what, about 150 years old. So bear that in mind. It's, it's written in a very different time, a very different place. But a classic, a favourite, and I really hope you enjoy it. And I'll have just a little bit of a chat afterwards and take the evening from there. Okay. So, this is Rumple Stiltskin. Once, there was a miller who was poor, but had a beautiful daughter. Now it happened that he had to speak to the king, and in order to make himself appear important, he said to him, I have a daughter who can spin straw into gold. The king said to the miller, That is an art which pleases me well. If your daughter is as clever as you say, bring her tomorrow to my palace, and I will try what she can do. And when the girl was brought to him, he took her into a room which was quite full of straw, gave her a spinning wheel and a reel, and said, Now set to work. If by tomorrow morning early you have not spun this straw into gold, you must die. Thereupon, he himself locked up the room and left her in it alone. So there sat the poor miller's daughter, and for her life could not tell what to do. She had no idea how straw could be spun into gold, and she grew more and more miserable, until at last she began to weep. But all at once the door opened, and in came a little man, and said, Good evening, Mistress Miller. Why are you crying so? Alas, answered the girl, I have to spin straw into gold, and I do not know how to do it. What will you give me, said the little man, if I do it for you? Um, my necklace, said the girl. The little man took the necklace, seated himself in front of the wheel, and whirr, 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 three turns, and the reel was full. Then he put on another, and whirr, 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 three times round, and the second was full too. And so it went on until the morning, when all the straw was spun and all the reels were full of gold. By daybreak, the king was there, and when he saw the gold, he was astonished and delighted, but his heart became only more greedy. He had the miller's daughter taken into another room full of straw, which was much larger and commanded her to spin that also in one night if she valued her life. The girl knew not how to help herself, and was crying when the door again opened, and the little man appeared and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw into gold for you? The ring on my finger, answered the girl. The little man took the ring again began to turn the wheel, and by morning had spun all the straw into glittering gold. The king rejoiced beyond measure at the sight, but still he had not 
gold enough. He had the miller's daughter taken into a still larger room full of straw and said, You must spin this too in the course of this night, but if you succeed, you shall be my wife. Even if she be a miller's daughter, thought he, I could not find a richer wife in the whole world. When the girl was alone, the little man came again for the third time and said, "'What will you give me if I spin the straw for you this time also?' "'I have nothing left that I could give,' answered the girl. "'Then promise me, if you should become queen, your first child.' Hmm. "'Well, who knows whether that will ever happen,' thought the miller's daughter. And, not knowing how else to help herself in this difficulty, she promised the little man what he wanted. And for that, he once more span the straw into gold. And when the king came in the morning, and found all as he had wished, he took her in marriage, and the pretty miller's daughter became a queen. A year after, she had a beautiful child, and she never gave a thought to the little man. But suddenly he came into her room and said, Now give me what you promised. The queen was horror-struck, and offered the little man all the riches of the kingdom if he would leave her the child. But the little man said, No, something that is alive is dearer to me than all the treasures in the world. Then the queen began to weep and cry, so the little man pitied her. "'I will give you three days' time,' said he. "'If by that time you find out my name, then you shall keep your child.' So the queen thought the whole night of all the names that she had ever heard, and she sent a messenger over the country to inquire, far and wide, for any other names there might be. When the little man came the next day, she began with Caspar, Melchior, Balthazar, and said all the names she knew, one after another. But to every one the little man said, That is not my name. On the second day, she had inquiries made in the neighbourhood as to the names of the people there, and she repeated to the little man the most uncommon and curious. Perhaps your name is Short Ribs or sheepshanks, or lace leg. But he always answered, That is not my name. On the third day, the messenger came back again and said, I have not been able to find a single new name. But as I came to a high mountain at the end of the forest, where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, there I saw a little house. Before the house a fire was burning, and round about the fire... A funny little man was jumping. He hopped upon one leg and shouted, Today I brew, tomorrow I bake, and next I shall the queen's child take. Ah, well it is, none knows the same, that Rumpelstiltskin is my name. You may think how glad the queen was when she heard the name, and when soon afterward the little man came in and asked, now, Mistress Queen, what is my name? She said, Is your name Conrad? No. Is your name Harry? No. Perhaps your name is... Rumpelstiltskin. The devil has told you that! The devil has told you that! cried the little man, and in his anger he stamped his right foot so deep into the earth that his whole leg went in, and then in rage he pulled at his left leg so hard with both hands that he tore himself in two. And that is the end of Rumpelstiltskin. It's a very short little story and a rather curious one. 
At the end, though, I, I don't know who to be the most sorry for, to be honest. And um, I was thinking a little bit about the, the morals there, and I wondered what, what you guys thought of it. And I also just had a little look around at other translations and a little bit of the, the sort of discussion online about Rumpelstiltskin. And the, the ending differs a little bit depending on which uh, version you're, you're looking at. So in, in one version he jumps out of the window on a ladle. On one of them he stamps so vigorously that he creates a chasm and then falls down the hole. And there's this one where he tears himself in half trying to get his leg free because he'd got so disturbed. And there's various different interpretations of what exactly and who exactly Rumpelstiltskin is. Uh, he's described in this translation as a little man. In some translations he's described as an imp. And there are other versions as well. I was going to just have a little read through the wiki for you. It's only quite short, but just a little bit of extra context. I thought it was kind of fun. So, Rumpelstiltskin is a fairy tale popular associated with Germany, where it is known as Rumpelstiltchen. The tale was once collected by the Brothers Grimm in the 1812 edition of Children's and Household Tales. And then it says, In order to appear superior, a miller lies to the king, telling him that his daughter can spin straw into gold. Some versions make the miller's daughter blonde and describe the straw into gold claim as a careless boast the miller makes about the way his daughter's straw-like blonde hair takes on a gold-like luster when sunshine strikes it. The king calls for the girl shuts her in a tower room filled with straw and a spinning wheel and demands she spin the straw into gold by morning or he will cut off her head. Other versions have the king threatening to lock her up in a dungeon forever or to punish her father for lying. So, slightly less. Uh, when she has given up all hope, an imp-like creature appears in the room and spins the straw into gold in return for her necklace. Since he only comes to people seeking a deal or trade. When next morning the king takes the girl to a larger room filled with straw to repeat the feat, the imp once again spins in return for the girl's ring. On the third day, when the girl has taken to an even larger room filled with straw and told by the king that he will marry her <clears throat> if she can fill this room with gold or execute her, what kind of deal is that? That is love, isn't it? That is star-crossed love. Or execute her if she cannot. The girl has nothing left with which she can pay the strange creature. He extracts from her a promise that she will give him her firstborn child, and so he spins the straw into gold a final time. In some versions, the imp appears and begins to turn the straw into gold, paying no heed to the girl's protest that she has nothing to pay him with. So that's, you know, even more messed up. When he finishes the task, he states that the price is her first child and the horrified girl objects because she never agreed to this arrangement. The king keeps his promise to marry the miller's daughter, but when their first child is born, the imp returns to claim his payment. Now give me what you promised. She offers him all the wealth she has to keep the child, but the imp has no interest in her riches. He finally consents to give up his claim to the child if she can guess his name within three days. Some versions have the imp limiting the number of daily guesses to three, and hence the total number of guesses allowed to be a maximum of nine. Her many guesses fail, but before the final night, she wanders into the woods... In some versions, she sends a servant into the woods instead of going herself in order to keep the king's suspicions at bay. And you might also say that that would probably just be more accurate as a queen. It probably wouldn't be allowed or it wouldn't be safe to wander off like that. Searching for him and comes across his remote mountain cottage and watches unseen as he hops about his fire and sings. In his song's lyrics, and these lyrics are a little bit different, again there are different variations, 
Tonight, tonight, my plans I make. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the baby I take. The queen will never win the game, for Rumpelstiltskin is my name. What a gloater. He reveals his name. When the imp comes to the queen on the third day, after first feigning ignorance, she reveals his name, Rumpelstiltskin, and he loses his temper and their bargain. Versions vary about whether he accuses the devil or witches of having revealed his name to the queen. In the 1812 edition of the Brothers Grimm tales, Rumpelstiltskin then ran away angrily and never came back. The ending was revised in an 1857 edition to a more gruesome ending, wherein Rumpelstiltskin, in his rage, drove his right foot so far into the ground that it sank up to his waist, then in a passion he seized the left foot with both hands and tore himself in two. Other versions have Rumpelstiltskin driving his right foot so far into the ground that he creates a chasm and falls into it, never to be seen again. In the oral version, originally collected by the Brothers Grimm, Rumpelstiltskin flies out of the window on a cooking ladle. And, uh, yeah, there's a little, little section that says, History. According to researchers at Durham University and the NOVA University Lisbon, The story originated around 4,000 years ago. However, many biases led some to take the results of this study with caution, so perhaps it's not quite that old. Um, And then it says the same story pattern appears in numerous other cultures. Tom Tit Tot in England from English Fairy Tales 1890 by Joseph Jacobs, The Lazy Beauty and Her Aunts in Ireland, from the Fireside Stories of Ireland, 1870 by Patrick Kennedy, Whoopity Story in Scotland, from Robert Chambers' Popular Rhymes of Scotland, 1826, and Gilly Trut, oof, not sure how you pronounce that, in Iceland, uh, and there's various other versions. It's incredibly world spread. Like, there's Arabic, Russian, Czech, Slovakian, Croatian, South American, Hungarian. Um, yeah, a couple of others. Uh, French. Remarkable, really. Um, and then we're talking about regional accents and things in different languages within countries and whatnot. The Cornish tale, uh, Cornish being one of the native languages of the British Isles down in the southwest, um, almost almost extinct, unfortunately. The Cornish tale of Duffy and the Devil plays out an essentially similar plot featuring a devil named Terry Top. And then I thought this was sort of interesting. The name Rumpelstiltchen in German means literally little rattle stilt a stilt being a post or pole that provides support for a structure a rumpelstilt or rumpelstilch was consequently the name of a type of goblin also called a pop heart or poppet that makes noises by rattling posts and rapping on planks. The meaning is similar to rumpelgeist, rattle ghost, or poltergeist, a mischievous spirit that clatters and moves household objects. Other related concepts are mummets, or boggarts, and hobs which are mischievous household spirits that disguise themselves. The ending chun is a German diminutive cognate to English kin. The name is believed to be derived from Johann Fisch... I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Johann Fiskart, maybe? His loose adaptation 
of, of, of another story which refers to an amusement for children, i.e. a children's game named Rumpel Stilt Oda de Popart. So, you know, this this whole concept has been around, you know, this is 500 years ago. So even if it's not 4,000 years old, there has obviously been this sort of theme for many, many, many centuries. Uh, and there's even a, a reference to um, psychology here as well, called the Rumpelstiltskin Principle. The value and power of using personal names and titles is well established in psychology, management, teaching, and trial law. It is often referred to as the Rumpelstiltskin Principle. And there's various sources chatting about that. So there we go, Rumpelstiltskin, boys and girls. Thank you so very much for everybody that's popped in to this little book club this evening. I really hope you enjoyed the reading of Rumpelstiltskin and the little chat about it afterwards and the very lengthy little catch-up that we had before. It was so nice to see you popping in to the chat, saying hello, giving me a little bit of feedback and we had a little bit of a ramble about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care, look after yourself, stay foxy, and I will read to you right now over in the Dracula live premiere. All right, good night, everybody. 